Thank you, Peter. And hello, everybody. And first of all, can I say, A, I'm really delighted to be here. And thank you for taking your time and your precious evening. I do appreciate it. It is rather strange for me presenting to a blank screen. I'm more used to being able to engage with the audience. So I'll do my best to imagine I can see all your faces and do what I would normally do in terms of looking at your, your expressions and your body language. So today we're going to talk about Ada Lovelace um, in terms of who she was and why she was so significant in terms of diversity. A little bit of a canter through my career in a sort of light-hearted way and then sort of a, a dive into why diversity matters and what we can do about that. So just a little bit more about myself despite um, Peter's very helpful introduction, thank you. Um, so I've been in IT for around 35 years. So yes, clearly I started at five years old because I'm only 40, obviously. Um, I'm married to Stuart and I've got my son William who's 26 and actually he helped me tonight to make sure I'd kind of got everything plugged in because despite my role, I don't consider myself to be a fantastically PC techie and therefore I can get a little bit confused from time to time. I also have a menagerie of animals, dogs, cats, koi fish, tropical fish, etc. And as Peter said, I'm currently the interim CIO at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And I'll talk a little more about my career um, in later slides. Just as a plug for Great Ormond Street, as if it was necessary, we are the largest centre for child heart surgery in the UK and one of the largest centres for transportation of hearts in the world. We've also been recently awarded HIMSS OEMRM 7. Now, that's a little bit of a mouthful for those of you who may have no familiarity, but HIMSS are a health informatics organisation and MRAM, MRAN is how we measure effective electronic medical record adoption and maturity. So in simple senses, on a scale from one to seven, it's how a hospital determines its level of digital maturity. So we are the first hospital in England to get the highest level for outpatients. And we were previously in July of this year awarded stage six, the penultimately highest level for both inpatients and outpatients, which makes us the first hospital in Europe to achieve this. So it's quite an achievement and I can't take any um, recognition for any of that or any credit because I only joined them in June just as a, an interim period, but it's an amazing achievement. So in terms of Ada Lovelace, so Ada's the daughter or was the daughter of Lord and Lady Byron, born back in 1815. She had but a short life, unfortunately, dying in November of 52 when she was um, not quite, or well, just past 36, coming up to 37. Despite being a very young woman and being born back in 1800s, she was a mathematician. She was an extremely bright person and she was actually very interested in the study of flight she um, analysed and studied how the wings of birds worked and she had a great interest in aviation and trying to imagine how man could fly one day. Um, through her teens, she became much more involved with scientists and through a, a mutual uh, colleague or friend, she got involved with Charles Babbage's work. And really as part of that, she then started to speculate on how the computer could be more used for more than just a calculation, a mathematical calculation. And some regard some of the papers and notes she made on this work, having done some translation of an Italian um, scientist, she was regarded by some to have recognised the full potential of computers and often cited as the first computer programmer, although obviously not as we would know it. I never cease to be amazed by, as we look back in history, the amazing intelligence and and innovative thinking and out of the box imagination that we see from some of the, the famous people in the past. I can't begin to imagine how they did that when I look at, you know, my world and how I've operated. It's just quite incredible. Ada Lovelace Day is, as we understand, an international celebration of the achievements of women in the STEM subjects. Um, and she's used and has been used for many years in that way. I first actually presented a, an Ada Lovelace colloquium back in 2012 um, for BCS Women. And um, in that sense, I've sort of come full circle now, I think, at the point in my career then and where I am today. And so Ada Lovelace and the, the events that take place on the anniversary of her birth, um, sorry, on her anniversary back in October, um, aims to increase the profile of women in the STEM subject and create role models that will encourage more women to move into STEM careers and, of course, supporting women already in STEM. 
so a little sort of talk through my career highlights and um, this is rather sort of self-reflective and somewhat sort of embarrassing I suppose but I do look back at it with some humour. So I um, left school at 16, I didn't follow traditional courses for various reasons, my father's health and frankly my determination to just get out and start earning some money and have a good time. Um, I left at 16 with a good array of, of, of qualifications in terms of O-levels. I got an A in maths and um, English, etc. And I got into banking. And after a few years in banking, I realised that perhaps the dress code that applied to women in those days and a very pleasant and well-intended banking um, director, the, managing, uh, the manager of the bank, who would come along and perhaps... Um, I don't quite know how to say this, but he would do a bit of a hop and a skip and a jump and kick our behinds. And he might potentially occasionally twang our brass straps. Utterly inappropriate. But I have to say back in those days, it wasn't the shock that it would be today. Um, but I sort of after three years, I thought, well, not really for me. Too much like hard work, too, too controlled. So then I went and joined a very large pharmaceutical company, Roche. And I worked in HR for three years, and that was good fun. I had a great time there. Um, but I was also the receiver of IT services way back then, and those IT services weren't great, and it was quite cumbersome getting reports on payroll and reports of employees and managing staff salaries. And then I moved into sales and marketing after three years in HR, still at Roche. And again, that was wonderful. I was part of the team that managed the export sales territories. So I had lots of interaction with folk in Africa and the Caribbean. And again, I was starting to use IT more to try and get reports of our sales and understand, you know, what what we were doing and what we might need to do differently. And in those days, we had a solution called RAMIS2. I can't remember now what that stands for, but it'll be one of the many acronyms you come across in IT. And so RAMIS2 was a fourth generation programming language. And I became quite adept in sales and marketing at being able to write simple um, programs to get the reports that I wanted from the database of sales and customers. And people started to suggest that maybe I should look for a career in IT. So I went and had a chat to the director of IT, wonderful gentleman. But at that time, it was quite amusing because he kind of looked at me and uh, he was a bit Oxbridge. And he looked at me and he sort of uh, looked at my CV and my details and he said, uh, so why didn't you go to university then? So I kind of explained that I didn't particularly want to do that, didn't feel the need. And um, he was a bit dismissive, but they sent me on a course, uh, not a course, they sent me to do a test. So I did a BIS aptitude test. And the first time I did that, I got a pretty decent score, but I was quite slow. So they got me to do it again. And the next time I did it, I did pretty well. And it came back recommending that I should be um, considered as a trainee. So I was put on the graduate development program alongside with a whole bunch of graduates. And what was interesting when we talk about diversity is this is way back in 1985. And the group of graduates was two chaps and two girls. Um, the chaps were a zoologist and a sociologist. And then one of the girls was a librarian. And I confess, I forget what the other girl's qualification was. But the point is, not a single one of them had an IT related um, degree or had done any discipline in, in, sale, um, in IT at all. So we were the little cohort in 1985 and we had a wonderful time. I have to say it was, it was quite, quite good fun. Quite a lot of parties and um, quite a lot of entertainment. I was programming COBOL on an IBM 4381, which ran DOS VSE, and it had 64K of memory. Can you believe that? And the size of the um, box was bigger than my dining room, which I know you can't see really clearly because it's quite dark in here. But it was a huge machine, and it had 64K of memory. There were also virtual machines in those days. So to some degree, everything goes full circle, doesn't it? Because everything's virtual now. Well, it was back in 1985 on this huge beast of a machine. Um, but I progressed through programming and business analysis into project management. And in 96, 98, I was the IT lead for Roche's successful SAP implementation in the UK. And I then led the post implementation support organization after that. And that was probably a real turning point for me because that was my first major program. And whilst we were a, a UK implementation, it was used as the basis around the world in terms of what Roche did with SAP. And of course, it was all done in the 
the lead up to the millennium, which was all going to be terrifying. And we were all absolutely on, you know, nerve ending for that. And of course, we all know that the millennium passed with a complete damp squid in most organisations. So then in 2000, I was asked to move across to sales and marketing and develop a strategy and roadmap specifically for them. They felt that really ERP had been very great for the organization, but didn't do much for sales and marketing. And they asked me to help establish a dedicated organization for sales and marketing. So I did that. And alongside of that, I then got involved in rolling out ITIL globally. So Roche was now starting to look at globalizing IT. At this time, we were still independent units in different uh, sites around the world in different countries. And this was now moving towards globalization and the reduction of local data centers, the reduction of things like manufacturing as well, by the way, and research. So that was quite interesting. And that sort of got me more and more towards this representing the needs of the business in IT, because as the work stream lead globally for sales and marketing as the service management function, it was very much trying to help IT understand that, for example, with sales reps, we used to have to issue them CDs um, to send out so that they could apply patches to their computers. Now, sales reps work all day going around doing their job and they get home in the evenings. There's no help desk. There's no one there for them to call upon. And they'll get in the post a CD that says, please make sure you've installed this on your computer. And I would find that the um, networking team globally would then take the attitude that if this wasn't done within 24 hours, they were going to kick those sales reps off the system. And that, to me, was quite entertaining because we'd have had a fabulously secure network with no business. So it was right back then in the early 2000s, it was all about understanding a balance of risk versus benefit and reward and understanding the customer perspective. I then moved on to some global IT leadership roles um, and I moved away from Roche after 26 years, which was quite a, quite a decision, but I hit my mid 40s and decided that if I didn't take control of my life, I was probably going to have it controlled for me because as I got into my mid 40s, I thought it was probably going to become a little bit more challenging to just find jobs if I got made redundant. And so although that wasn't on the cards, I didn't want to take a risk of that. And I didn't believe that I would be doing the same job for the next 20 years. So I chose to move on. Um, I set up as an independent business consultant, did that for about 12 months. But during that period, Takeda was one of my first clients. And they asked me to go permanent after about six months. And that led me into a number of other global leadership roles. It was brilliant working for Takeda because they're a Japanese organization in the top 10 of companies in Japan. And I discovered I really enjoyed learning about different cultures and understanding how people worked. Um, and Takeda then decided to open an office in Singapore. And I was lucky enough to be part of the team that established that office. And then I set up and managed the IT. So that was good fun. Did that for about seven years and then decided that I really fancied a bit of a move. And Takeda was um, going through some interesting challenge. It had made some major acquisitions. It was looking to streamline its business. And Europe had always been a bit of the small relation compared to America and Japan. And so there was uh, plans to reduce the footprint in the London office. So I decided that it was time to move on. And I was approached to be CIO at the Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Foundation Trust. Now, I'd never considered working in public sector, having spent the previous significant period of years, if you add six, uh, seven and um, 26 together. And um, I, I, I didn't really know what to think. But when I read the specification for the role, it just pressed all the right buttons, because although it was a national organisation and therefore to some degree smaller, I was going to be the master of, of my own environment and I would stand or fail on the decisions that I made to some degree. You know, there wasn't a global organisation above me telling me which laptops to use or to telling me which databases we were using or even which systems to select. So I was very excited to take that role on. And my father and my husband and my husband's father had been, and my husband still is today, patient of Harefield Hospital. So it was a really nice connection. So whilst I was at um, the Royal Brompton, we had to overhaul all of the IT infrastructure and the clinical systems. And some of the stories you hear are true. There's been a significant underinvestment in IT infrastructure in the NHS. And uh, one of my favourite stories, which I promise you is true, and I have photographs, 
although I wouldn't share them, is one day I was down in the um, archives area um, and it, I also had responsibility for medical records. So I was down in the archives area with the head of medical records, taking me around these catacombs to have a look at um, the environment. And as we rounded one of the corners in these sort of just like a Victorian catacombs, you know, they're very old buildings, some of the hospital buildings. We came to a room which was obviously a plant room. You know, it had got danger, however many thousand volts, do not enter, etc. on it. And it was a metal door with a metal door handle. And underneath this door, I promise you, was water. And I looked at this water and I looked at this door and I looked at my head of um, medical records. And she said, oh, that's, yeah, that's quite common. She said, we often get some leaks down here. And she put her hand out to open the door. And I'm sort of like, oh, my God, you can't open the door. There's water. It's metal. But she opened the door. And as we went in this door, which was indeed a plant room, you know, there were cables hanging from the ceiling and the the cables had pulled away at the ceiling and had dislodged a pipe. And this pipe was dripping and under the pipe was a bucket and the bucket was now full and overflowing with water, hence the flood on the floor. And that that is quite a, a you know a typical challenge. And the IT data center rooms were in a similar state of array. Some some day someone had pulled out a plug because they wanted to plug their computer in, thinking they'd just pulled out an Ethernet cable. It wasn't. It was the cable that connected the entire trust to the internet service. So we lost our internet for several hours because no one could believe it was that similar simpler problem. And in fact, you know, people were running around assuming it was the third party vendor and provider or the fiber in the road. But no, someone had just pulled an Ethernet cable out of the data center port. Amazing. So it was a very interesting time. And I guess because of my private sector background, I'd seen a lot of examples of what good looks like. And that gave me a lot of confidence and and knowledge about what had to be done and how to go about it. And as part of that, I was a great fan of the cloud. So rather than investing in tin that took up space in precious hospitals, my view was we had to move to the cloud. And I was one of the very first NHS CIOs to move patient data out into the cloud in August 16, when Microsoft got Privacy Shield. We sort of knew that the Schrems law was going to come along and knock out Privacy Shield. But, you know, nonetheless, it was the right thing to do. And of course, you know, that's history now when we no longer have to worry. We've got the data centers for Amazon and for um, for Azure from Microsoft here in the UK, amongst others. So that was good fun. I then, after five years, having delivered the plan at the Royal Brompton, was starting to wonder what I might do next. And I got a call about um, a role in Sidra in Qatar. And my first reaction was, what on earth would I want to go there? I don't know much about it, except I know they've got the World Cup in 2022. But uh, the folks were very persistent. And in the end, while I was on holiday with my family in the US, I took a call and we had a chat and I talked to my family and we decided I'd go for it. And so that was in the latter part of 2017. And I got the the offer um, in the early 18 and I started out there in May. My plan was never to be there for terribly long. My husband's health is not great. But I really felt that the Middle East was somewhere I'd never been. I'd not had much experience, having been lucky enough to travel to an awful lot of other places, not the Middle East. So I thought I'd give it a go. And at the time I joined, there were still quite a lot of people there who'd actually been in the NHS. So it was nice to meet people who, if not directly um, part of my network, were still people from a familiar environment. And uh, while I was there, I had to carry out a major restructure of the IT organisation. So I had about 250 people and we took that down to around 200. And we also upgraded our main patient record system, the CERNA platform. So that was was quite an experience. And I did have a lovely time. And those brunches were amazing, I have to say. Of all the things I miss, I miss the brunches. Those were good fun. So then um, I decided, right, OK, I'm coming back to the UK. What am I going to do now? And actually, that was quite challenging because I sort of thought, I don't know if I want to go back into another permanent big role. I am at the other end of my career now. So so what shall I do? So I'm a great believer in fate. Things just happen sometimes. And uh, I got contacted for a few things. And so I was doing a little bit of advisory, some consultancy. I did another interim role for a pharmaceutical company. And then in the summer of this year, 2020, I was approached to be CIO at GOSH for a, an interim period. 
And obviously with a brand like Great Ormond Street, who could resist? So happily took that on. Again, it wasn't quite, from my point of view, the positioning I would have ideally liked, but there was some great work to be done, including a major restructure and a very significant cybersecurity program. Gosh, like many of the NHS, got hit quite um, scarily back in April of this year. Now, the good thing was it was a targeted phishing um, attack across, as I say, a lot of the NHS. And yes, we did have people who foolishly, unfortunately, fell for it and clicked on links and entered their um, credentials. But fortunately, that didn't result in any denial of service, no data breach. So it was more of a vet sort of a mischievous and an unsettling thing, but it caused us to have a wake up. And uh, as a result of that, the trust has invested in a very large cybersecurity program, which I've been very happy to help get off the ground. And we're starting to, to really make some progress. So that's been pretty cool. And now I've got a new adventure coming up. I'm not going to sort of name the organisation because I don't like to tempt fate and the ink isn't dry. But I have a an offer of a new CIO role in a very large um, NHS Foundation Trust, a little further away from London than ideally I would like. But uh, nonetheless, that's also got some some opportunity to it. So I should be away from home two or three nights a week, assuming that goes ahead as planned at the beginning of November. So I look back and I think I've had an amazing time. And what makes me really excited about IT as we get on to the bit about diversity is it really is so broad and so deep. And I worry that people have got a very narrow view of what a career in IT means. And for me, my background, you know, my career today, I think, highlights different different industry, um, global, regional, local, large, small and really, you can just have no other, no other organi- no other um, profession, as far as I'm concerned, gives you such a breadth and depth of opportunity, and such flexibility to d- work where you want. Really, so I, I just get very, very excited about a career in IT, and it so frustrates me that other people don't necessarily um, understand this yet. So, looking now at some. Re- key reports produced by BCS over 2017 and 2020. You can read the details, so I won't read it verbatim. But it's pretty shocking, isn't it, to see those sort of figures. And it's absolutely horrendous, I think, that bottom one, that although today, for the first time, women are now making up more than 20% of the specialist tech workforce, which is still clearly 20% when it could be 50%, um, but black women make up less than 1%. And this is really just shocking, but it's very true. If I think about my entire career, I can think of plenty of women. And actually, in the NHS, there are a lot of women IT leaders. So the the gender divide in the NHS isn't so bad. But ethnicity is still a bit of a worry. See quite a lot of folks from um, Asian uh, uh, communities and, and backgrounds, but we don't see enough people from the sort of black backgrounds. And I don't know why that is. So why does it matter? Well, these are obviously some direct quotes from various um, articles I've been able to to read, but also some of the thoughts in the centre are really very much mine. So, I mean, clearly, again, you can read, but there is a, a view that inclusion really helps improve absenteeism. And a, a, by one survey I looked at, by nearly a day a year per employee. That's huge. There's also research that indicates that by bringing some of the um, folks who've done career breaks, you know, women returners, for example, after um, having families, that can deliver back phenomenal gains to the economy because because they come back into the workforce, they're earning money, they're spending more money. Very interesting. And that one in McKinsey report, albeit back in 2015, more likely to have increased financial returns above the industry medium if they've got in the top quartile for gender, racial, racial and ethnic, uh, ethnic, oh gosh, ethnic diversity. Sorry about that. So it is really quite interesting, isn't it? Now, from my point of view, diversity matters for all of those reasons. And obviously it matters because it's just not right for it to be unbalanced or unfair. It helps address a skills gap, though, because we all know how hard it is to find the the best people when you're trying to recruit into an organisation for some specialist IT roles, there's often a shortage. So we've got a shortage of skills in terms of availability of resource. 
And yet we've got a huge percentage of people out there who don't seem to be in, in IT in the first place. Of course, they're not in the market. I do believe it builds a better outcome. The whole view of the sum of the whole versus the sum of the parts, I'm really, really a strong believer in that. I do think that the collaboration, the debate, the challenge shapes a much better outcome. And I think having more views in terms of whether it's disability, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's gender, I think all of those inputs have something special they bring to the table. And ultimately, it means we deliver a better outcome, a better product. And I do believe you, it gives you a much more balanced, happier workforce. I think there's something to be said about having that difference. If everyone is the same, I'm not sure that that results in um, such a, a, you know, a, a balanced and happier environment to work in. According to a PwC report, this is the one that really, really distresses me. As you look at these figures, you know, studying STEM subjects at school, OK, females are a bit behind the males, then going to university. But a career of choice, only 3% of women see technology as a career of choice and only 15% of men or boys. Why is that? It just, just grieves me greatly. 5% of leadership positions in the technology sector are held by women. 78% of students can't name a famous female working in technology. And yet there was Ada back in 18, whatever, 1820s or so, you know, doing amazing things and working with Babbage on, on the power of computing. Now, my thoughts for what it's worth is, is it discrimination or is it choice? Now, I realise that there will be people with all sorts of experiences and I'm not for one second denying those. And of course, I accept that discrimination exists, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And that's, that's you know, abhorrent and it shouldn't be allowed and we must do everything we can. But I also think there is this element of choice. I think that for whatever reason, people are not necessarily so drawn to it. And I think when we look at some of these stereotypes, and I adore the Big Bang Theory. I have watched every episode of the Big Bang Theory multiple times, not once or twice. In my household, it's pretty much the only thing my, my husband has on as the background during the day. It's an amazing program. And I know that it's not deliberately painting people badly but come on you know there's a stereotype there if it's very geeky you know amy is not really the um the pinup whereas um obviously we've got um oh gosh there's amy and there's the names have just gone straight out of my mind but penny of course you know she's our waitress in the cheesecake factory who aspires to be an actress it's not really great and then the it crowd I mean, I must admit that every time I've been um, in an NHS hospital, the IT team is typically in the basement, and they certainly are in the last two organisations I've worked in. And yet we've got all of these amazing people who I'm not going to embarrass myself and try and name because I shall forget them. But the lady on the top left in this bottom corner here, she's the lady who worked with Steve Jobs to design the user interface for Apple computers. You know, and I, I, I don't remember her name and all those other amazing people. Now, there is a view that access to education clearly does contribute. In America, I know there is a real belief that the reason they don't see more blacks and Hispanics in technology is because of a lack of education. But also, I think it is the lack of role models. And I think it is around the fact that people see IT around gaming and geeky and, and not cool and, you know, perhaps not what they aspire to. And yet, when you look at it, it can take you around the world. You can be very forward facing, very much involved with all of the folks in the business. You don't have to be in a very technical role. But of course, those technical roles are also desperately important. We, we couldn't manage without them. So I think stereotypes need to change. And I think IT needs to start at school. And I don't just mean by introducing programming to toddlers. I mean, in terms of really getting the message across about the power of a professional career in IT. So to me, it really is cool. I'd be very interested in, in hearing questions or comments from the yeah. audience because I realise this is a potentially yeah. quite emotive topic. There will be people, as I say, who I'm sure have, have 
you know, suffered with some discrimination in terms of their ability to progress. I know this has been a topic that BCS itself has been discussing. And in fact, BCS Hertfordshire has had quite a debate on this. And I know that there, there are certainly some who share the same view as I do, that it is perhaps more about choice. And we've got to get our kids, male and female, of all ethnicities, races, etc., to understand what a great opportunity is. And I think we need to do that by you know, doing as much as we can to talk to kids in school. And I think we need those role models. I think we need more interesting things on TV that promotes the sophisticated and exciting side of IT. We've got wonderful programmes on television about people in law. You know, that seems to be quite cool, quite sexy. Um, I don't quite understand why IT's got this this alternative um, stereotype associated with it. But I think I've probably rambled on enough. I really hope you've got some questions. It would be great to get some feedback, even if you want to disagree with me or perhaps tell us something about an experience you've had and share that. I'd be very happy to hear from you. Thank you very much, Joe. We have a question from David Berg. I think it's a soft G rather than a hard G. Um, perhaps the other way around. He says, hi, Joe. Did you find there was a difference between the approach to information security between the UK and Qatar? Um, that's a great question. And the simple answer is yes. So certainly in the Middle East, much more paranoid about attack, obviously, because of the, the geopolitical environment. And, you know, the reality Qatar themselves had been um, targeted you know, they would obviously say by Saudi, I couldn't possibly comment or judge on the reality of that. But the Emir um, had had part of his IT environment, I think it was his Twitter account breached. So so yes, they were extremely concerned. And so the conversation about cloud and data residency outside of country was a much tougher, a tougher debate. But by the time I left, I'm pleased to say that they absolutely were moving forward and looking in that direction. So a lot more security. About 50% of the IT budget was spent on IT internal solutions as opposed to business alone solutions. And a very significant proportion of that was actually related to um, security. The size of the IT, the IT team, the security team was larger. So, yes, it was um, a much, much uh, a bigger focus than in the UK. And the UK is still pretty significant. We've also had a number of people interested in learning more about the photos. You refer to some photos. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's so. I mean, I've, there's. Um, I'm trying to remember which bit of the photo where I made the reference to photos. I think that was probably around. I'd got photos of the wonderful room down in the medical records basement of the the, the water coming under the metal door. We also that's had right, that's um, the one. yes, yes. So uh, those are those are not for publication, but um, I do have them as well as having other very interesting photographs of appalling messes in computer rooms and holes in computer room walls, etc. OK, well, thank you very much uh, for, for, the, for the talk tonight. Thanks to um, people who have posted um, questions, not all of which we've been able to use. Um, I'd like to talk about our next event, which is about crowdsourcing. Uh, the topic is many hands make it light work. And it's about the transcription of the manuscripts of Jeremy Bentham, but it's fundamentally a crowdsourcing uh, event. And that's going to take place here on YouTube uh, on Wednesday, the 4th of November at 2020, sorry, at 4th of November 2020 at 7 p.m. Many thanks to Joe for a, a fascinating talk. Um, if you've enjoyed this, please make sure that you push the like button and let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. That's terribly important because it pushes our recognition up on, on YouTube. And do hit the notification bell so that you'll be informed about new Hertfordshire content and look for more videos coming soon. Well, I'd normally say uh, safe journey home, but as you're probably there already, I will say good night from BBC. B B S. Why do I keep on saying BBC when I mean BCS? <laughs> Hertfordshire. Good night.